Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 406. Well, I bet you have been in this situation. You've been talking to your friends about the state of the economy and that you're unhappy with the president's performance, and you've had a know-it-all friend who said, no, no, no. Actually, the president's economic performance has been quite good, notwithstanding the crazy criticisms of you incorrigible right-wingers and so on and so forth. I mean, that's what you'll get. Well, how do you answer some of these claims? And it so happens that today we're going to have David Stockman on the program, and normally I just talk to him about what's going on today, but I thought, you know, instead of just doing current events and what he's talking about on his blog, let's ask David Stockman himself how he would respond to some of the most common defenses of so-called Obamanomics. David Stockman served in the U.S. Congress before resigning in 1981 to accept appointment as Director of the Office of Management and Budget under Ronald Reagan, a position he held until 1985. He had a career on Wall Street, he eventually started his own private equity fund company based in Greenwich, Connecticut, and I strongly recommend to you his recent book, the Great Deformation, the Corruption of Capitalism in America, a sweeping revisionist economic history of the 20th century, and the best response to the arguments for the bailouts that I have ever seen. We release a new episode of The Tom Woods Show Monday through Friday, 30 minutes to make you a smarter libertarian, and this episode is a great example of just that. So make sure you subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher over at TomWoods.com so you get smarter and smarter every single day. David Stockman, welcome back to the show. Very happy to be with you, Tom. I had asked a bunch of my people on Facebook, what would you like me to ask David Stockman? And I think I'm going to keep those in reserve for the future because it occurred to me this morning that I would like the David Stockman reply to some of these claims I've been seeing that really the Obama economic record is pretty good considering where he started, and it's just a whole lot of right-wing ignorance that uh, would make people skeptical. So I'd like to, especially since you worked in the Reagan administration, there have been comparisons of the Reagan job performance with the Obama job performance. I, I thought you would be an interesting person to talk to about this. So for instance, I'm reading an article from Forbes, and of course you know Forbes online is highly variable in quality. It's like they let anybody post articles on Forbes. I don't know when they started that policy, but this is an update from March. Say, so, so a little bit out of date, sure. saying a U.S. economy adds 295,000 new jobs in February. This extends the string of 2,000K plus new jobs for 12 consecutive months, the best jobs growth performance since 94-95. Unemployment falls to 5.5%, a post-recession low. Let's just start with that one figure. Why is that not something to jump up and down? And by the way, if, if we were to come back and say the labor force participation rate is very low, they've got an answer for that. They say that's just the baby boomers retiring. That's demographic. That's not lack of job availability. What do you say to that? Well, there's a number of myths there. Let's take them one at a time. Uh, first of all, they're taking the job numbers totally out of context, ignoring the fact that we had a devastating recession, in fact, called the Great uh, Recession, that in the course of that, eight to nine million jobs were lost. And so, therefore, the Obama White House commenced at the very bottom of a deep hole and they're counting essentially born again jobs. I keep using that phrase because if we go back to December 207 before the big plunge occurred, there were 138.5 million uh, so-called payroll survey jobs in the American economy. That's the place to start. Here we are, more than seven years after the last peak, and there are only about 141 million jobs today. So we have had the lowest rate of job growth on a peak-to-peak -peak basis, uh, counting both the plunge during the recession and then the recovery afterwards for a sustained period that has ever been experienced before in U.S. history. Um, it amounts to, frankly, uh, if you set aside some of the very low-paying uh, kind of temp jobs that have been created in the bartender and restaurant and retail clerk sectors and so forth, uh, we have barely created 15,000 jobs a month uh, since uh, 2007. 
And uh, that um, compares to, say, 150,000 jobs a month that would be needed just to absorb the growth uh, of our uh, labor force and uh, population. So um, that number about jobs per month, I think, is phony baloney. Obviously, the low unemployment rate is a function of the numerator uh, and denominator, and the denominator is the labor force that has actually uh, had a huge plunge in the participation rate, as I think many of your viewers know. But it's worth uh, going back to those numbers. Today, there are 191 million people or excuse me, 91 million people, adults over age 16, who are not in the labor force. If we go back to the year 2000, there were only 75 million uh, uh, adult Americans not in the labor force. So we've had a huge pickup in that number, and it's not accounted for by uh, the baby boom retirees. Baby boom retirees may be up 7 million or so since the uh, year 2000, but obviously the uh, dropouts uh, from the labor force are, um, you know, have increased by uh, several orders of magnitude more than that. So I think what we have going on here is like political talking points, selective, um, you know, extraction of numbers from the BLS uh, uh, reports that uh, create a false picture of recovery. I think the better number that I keep using, and I report this in my blog once a month when the BLS numbers come out, is what I call um, the uh, full-time or breadwinner uh, employment total. And that uh, basically uh, represents uh, the manufacturing, the construction, the mainline white collar jobs, uh, distribution, wholesale, um, uh, and uh, those kinds of categories. And the point is we still have two million fewer jobs uh, today, 70 million rounded, than we had at the uh, turn of the century uh, 15 years ago, 72 million. So for the last a uh, decade and a half, the uh, breadwinner job uh, force, job count, by the BLS's own numbers, has been shrinking in America. And what we have done is create a lot of part-time jobs that pay, uh, you know, very low wages, average of $13 an hour, uh, generate less than 26 hours a week of work, which is not a full-time job uh, by any means. Uh, annual earnings at those rates of less than 20000 a year, clearly not something that can support a family and contributes a, a modest amount to GDP or economic growth. So uh, I think uh, what we have to do is get under the headline, um, not select arbitrary months, look at trends, uh, look at fundamentals, and when we do that, we see that we have a tremendous crisis of uh, what I would call the uh, economy stalling out, uh, income growth stalling out, and real uh, jobs uh, counted on an uh, accurate and honest basis uh, actually shrinking in the American economy. David, you mentioned your blog, so I want to take this opportunity to tell people that although you feel like the number of websites you're viewing is at its maximum, drop one of them and replace it with David Stockman's ContraCorner.com. I will be linking to it on today's show notes page. This is episode 406, so it'll be TomWoods.com slash 406. I'll, I'll also link to the article that I'm using for fodder for David here, which is this, this Forbes piece from late last year that keeps getting updated. Let's go back to that for a minute and see if if they're comparing apples and apples here. There's a comparison made in this article between Obama and Reagan. Now, again, I realize that they're not using the kind of metrics that you would want to use, so I want to know, is this a legitimate comparison? They're saying, uh, President, they're comparing Reagan, because, of course, he's dealing with a recession, too, and Obama's dealing with a recession, so they're, it's, they're both coming out of a recession, but they're saying... Uh, right here, 
that President Obama's job creation kept unemployment from peaking at as high a level as President Reagan and promoted people into the workforce faster than President Reagan. Obama has achieved a 6.1% unemployment rate in his sixth year, fully one year faster than President Reagan did. At this point in his presidency, President Reagan was still struggling with 7.1% unemployment, and he did not reach into the mid-low 6% range for another full year. So despite today's number, the Obama administration has still done considerably better better at job creating and reducing unemployment than did the Reagan administration. Now, bearing in mind that you don't endorse everything that was done during the Reagan administration, do you think this is a reasonable comparison? No, I don't. I think it's apples and oranges. Uh, the number of changes in the way the BLS measures the labor force and calculates the unemployment rate between the early and mid-1980s and the present um, uh, is uh, it would take a whole, you know, uh, hour discussion to go through all those changes. So we're not measuring the same thing, and so therefore the employment rate, uh, unemployment rate, uh, is is as I said, uh, an apples and oranges comparison. I think the better thing to do is look at the employment rate. Uh, particularly adjusted for the fact that even by the early 1980s, women had not fully uh, joined the labor force. And if we look at the participation rate for adult males, for instance, between uh, those uh, eight years and the uh, period of the Obama administration thus far, it was dramatically higher uh, during the 1980s uh, than it is uh, at the present time. And I think at the end of the day, what counts is you know, the employment rate, not the unemployment rate. The employment rate measures how many people are contributing real hours to the U.S. economy to generate output uh, and generate uh, a real standard of living. Uh, and so, again, I think uh, you just have pundits uh, who can take, uh, you know, the rich array of data that uh, they can put their hands on and uh, twist and uh, torque it. Uh, in uh, a manner to make things appear far better than they are. I think we have a real crisis of growth going on. This recovery has notwithstanding massive fiscal stimulus, as I talked about in the article that you mentioned, notwithstanding that the balance sheet of the Fed has gone from $900 billion to $4.5 trillion uh, over the last six years, notwithstanding all that stimulus, uh, we have an economy uh, that is more or less uh, stalled out uh, dead in the water. Real investment growth since 2007 uh, is less than 1%. Real investment growth after you set aside uh, current period depreciation and amortization, which you have to because uh, GDP each and every quarter represents some consumption of our uh, existing stock of uh, plant and equipment. So if you look at it on a net uh, investment basis, uh, investment uh, today uh, in the sixth year of the recovery uh, is 20% uh, lower than it was in 1999 and 2000. Th those are just some of the many metrics uh, that help amplify or you know, uh, uh, elucidate what the true trends are, and they're very uh, unfavorable. I'm looking right now at an article, again from late last year, this time in the New Republic. Obama's economic record is strong, even though wages are stagnant. And they say, They'll grant that he has some faults, and that they say one of his faults was that in 2010 and 2011, he became too interested in budget cutting and deficit cutting and debt reduction, and so he went along with the Republicans with the sequester and wound up uh, engaging in, in budget cutting, and this has been a bad thing because, as we've seen in Europe, cutting the budget is not good for economies. It seems like there are at least two major fallacies in that. Uh, how, do, how would you answer that claim? 
Well, first of all, if we look at Europe, uh, the economy that is keeping Europe uh, above water that is pulling all the freight is the German economy. Uh, and they have a balanced budget and they have one of the rare things in the contemporary world, a government that actually believes in fiscal rectitude. So uh, I would uh, uh, not look to Europe for evidence that Obama made a mistake. Secondly, this is just the same old Keynesian story that uh, is predicated on the view that uh, prosperity and growth and jobs and productivity and all the rest of it uh, comes out of uh, Washington, out of uh, the maneuvers and the uh, various kinds of stimulus uh, initiatives of the state rather either uh, from the fiscal and budget side or from the central banking uh, uh, apparatus. Uh, I, I don't buy that at all. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the free market is what produces uh, prosperity, is where we really get the productivity, the innovation, uh, the production that generates real income and real uh, living standard gains uh, over time. So um, the New Republic uh, is uh, obviously uh, a full, uh, you know, a full bore uh, drinker of uh, the Keynesian Kool-Aid. And uh, if you take enough of the Kool-Aid, uh, you can come to some pretty inaccurate uh, and uh, false conclusions. And clearly they have. They cite an IMF report which uh, is trying to come up with reasons for weak economic growth. And apparently in the report, a senior economist there says, infrastructure investment, even if debt financed, may well be justified. And the article goes on to say, well, who's been a major proponent of infrastructure spending, if not President Obama? He hasn't been able to get what he wants, but doggone it, we got to give him credit for trying. I know you, you appeared on television and talked about the whole infrastructure question uh, can you share some of that with us? Yeah, and of course, they're all uh, flapping their jaws about it right now in light of the Amtrak accident last week, which is very ironic because the real train wreck uh, in Philadelphia is Amtrak itself and not the unfortunate incident that occurred on the tracks uh, last week. Uh, we have wasted, as I indicated in an article that I posted uh, Thursday, $75 billion in today's purchasing power since the early 1970s when Amtrak was created. Now here is a, uh, a superb example of what the uh, Keynesians uh, would uh, propose in infrastructure spending and there's $75 billion of it and it has been one colossal waste. There is plenty of alternative transportation available to people that want, that want to get from one city to another, air, bus, and obviously the automobile. So if we look at the larger picture then, uh, there's no evidence that we're starving infrastructure in the United States or that our growth problem has anything to do with uh, lack of infrastructure. We spend $150 billion a year at the state and federal, uh, local state and federal level on highways and related transportation. In real terms, that's as high as we've ever done before. Highways and bridges aren't being starved. That is just a lot of uh, mythology that's peddled in the beltway in order to justify demands for additional spending. If we look at the rest of the infrastructure, I was uh, noting the other day that someone was complaining that uh, our uh, electrical power grid and utility capacity is uh, uh, wanting or uh, lacking. Well, I didn't know that that was a function of the state in the first place. Uh, public uh, power uh, was an idea of 100 years ago whose time has come and gone. We have the lowest interest rates imaginable and have had them for the last several decades. There's no evidence whatsoever that somehow utilities are being starved of the capital they need for uh, actual in uh, investment 
uh, in power production and transmission. What the critics are saying is we don't like the flavor that's being invested. We want more wind power and uh, less coal. Well, that's a different issue, uh, but it certainly has nothing to do uh, with uh, economic growth or with starving uh, the infrastructure. Uh, obviously, mass transit is a huge uh, waste of money in almost every area of the country. Uh, that uh, is not indicative of a need for uh, more infrastructure spending. Um, the uh, basic issue of things like uh, water uh, uh, product or water supply and uh, waste treatment, uh, those are not national issues. Those are responsibilities of state and local government and if they can persuade taxpayers to, to uh, raise uh, uh, bond issues or to tax themselves for more investment in that kind of infrastructure so be it but it's not anything that we can make a generic statement about on a nationwide basis and certainly uh, there's no evidence that it's causing economic growth to slow down as it has been or that uh, somehow again we need some a massive federal program. So behind all of this is just um, a this is just this whole infrastructure thing in my view is a cover story for more deficit spending. At the end of the day the Keynesians think they can make jobs and growth come out of bigger federal debts. That is wrong. It's been proved in spades now for the last several decades, both by Republicans and Democrats. And uh, we should recognize uh, what the uh, so-called infrastructure campaign is really all about. It's just a, uh, as I said, cover story to kind of revive the case for deficit spending that um, uh, has uh, obviously failed uh, during this uh, recovery effort and uh, the uh, Obama effort uh, to cause economic growth by borrowing $800 billion. It uh, didn't work. Most of it was a waste of money. A lot of it was one-time uh, subsidies to operating budgets uh, for state and local governments that never should have been appropriated in the first place. David, before I let you go, I guess we should say something about stocks, because I'm seeing in this Forbes article, this is, again, written toward the end of last year, investors have gained a remarkable 220% over the last five and a half years. This level of investor growth is unprecedented by any administration and has proven quite beneficial for everyone. Uh, are we really going to rain on this parade, too? <laughs> well, I think we should. Uh, first of all, it's very selective. That isn't 220%. Uh, from the last peak, that's 220% from the absolute dark bottom of March uh, 209, shortly after uh, the Obama White House uh, uh, took power. Uh, the, the point, though, is, of course, the stock market has soared, all financial assets have soared, because we have a central bank, the Federal Reserve, that's committed to massive money printing and distortion and falsification of all financial markets. This isn't real. This isn't sustainable. It's the third bubble of this century. And I think uh, we're reaching the point where uh, we're about ready to see the cracks and fissures uh, uh, start to spread. Um, and uh, therefore, to take a um, dangerous uh, exercise in central bank falsification uh, of uh, the financial economy of a bubble uh, that has been created on Wall Street and claim uh, that a big government uh, administration uh, is responsible uh, for that. I think, uh, you know, it's the height of absurdity, but it's just uh, one more measure of how far you know, the uh, dialogue or the narrative uh, coming out of Washington is off base. Well, David, I want to remind people, once again, davidstockmanscontracorner.com is where you want to go if you want to be able to, to have a defense for yourself when your friends raise these objections and say, look, Obama's done a fantastic job. What are you nutballs talking about? You'll have all the evidence right at your fingertips. And of course, 
I know we all feel like we get too much email as it is, but cancel a few of those things you're getting so that you can sign up for David's newsletter because this is what you need every day. You'll you'll be kept up to date on, on what's going on. You'll get all the lies and propaganda exposed. It is such a valuable resource. And again, we'll be linking to it at tomwoods.com slash 406. David, I can't thank you enough for being here today. Thanks so much. Very happy to be with you, Tom. All right, everybody, a couple reminders. Remember the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 406, will be helpful to you as a companion to this episode. And remember, I have produced, uh, not too long ago, I produced a free ebook called 14 Hard Questions for Libertarians Answered. You can get that free ebook by just simply texting the word liberty to 33444 and you will get that free ebook and you can you'll find ways to get it uh, as a Kindle, as an EPUB, as a PDF, whatever is best for you. Just text the word liberty to 33444 and I send out a newsletter every week and if you hate it, you can just stop getting it and you, meanwhile you got a free ebook. But it's just to remind people what I'm doing on the show, and you can see episodes that you'd be interested in, and any news items that I find, things like that, the Ron Paul Homeschool Program, keep people up to date on that. So text LIBERTY to 33444, and you'll get that free ebook. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.